Hey everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to take a look at three major themes that Jupiter in Aries is likely to express over the course of the next year while Jupiter transits back and forth through the sign of the Ram. So that is our agenda for today, and um, we're going to break it down into three different se sections. We're going to talk about movement, we're going to talk about courage, and we're going to talk about endurance. And I'm really happy that my wife Ashley is here today. Ashley is an herbalist, and uh, we're also going to talk about some herbs to match with these three themes, uh, herbs that can pair as teachers, herbs that are going to be really good to work with, um, given these three themes and kind of lessons that Jupiter and Aries tends to impart over and over again. Before I bring Ashley on, as always, please like and subscribe, share your comments in the comments section, click the notification bell for updates. It helps the channel to grow. Really appreciate that. If you want a transcript of any of my talks, you can find them usually within 24 hours on the website, nightlightastrology.com. And last but not least, don't forget my new class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, is coming up. That class starts on June 5th. If you want to learn more about it, you can go to my website, which is nightlightastrology.com and click on the courses page, scroll down, click on the first year course, and you can learn all about what the program includes. It is a one year course in ancient Hellenistic astrology designed to help you um, prepare you for reading charts for other people if you want to start a professional practice. Also perfect class for people who are just you know, this is your hobby. This is something you want to go more deeply with for the sake of personal growth and transformation. Of course, it tends to do that no matter what your intentions are behind studying it. But um, so check it out. Uh, if you have any questions about it, you can email us anytime. Info at nightlightastrology.com. The course includes 30 webinars over the course of a year, which I lead. And those webinars happen on Sundays from noon Eastern to about 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, uh, two to three hour classes throughout the year. In between those 30 classes. They're broken into units. And in between units, we also have breakout study sessions with a staff of tutors that I uh, that work with me very closely throughout the year. They're some of my best and brightest students uh, that have gone through the programs themselves and are now practicing professionally. We also have 12 online webinars that are led by guest teachers outside of those 30 classes. There's a ton of support throughout the year. There's a group forum discussion with paid tutoring staff. You can email me with questions anytime. Um, you get to keep everything in the class if you can't make it live. Everything's recorded. You get to keep and download everything. So um, it's a wonderful program. You can take a certification exam at the end. We have lots of live clients that come into the classroom so you can see how the theory is actually applied and what a live reading looks like. We break down those readings together as a group. It's a wonderful program. Check out the early bird payment. That saves you $500 off if you use that before the start of the program. There is a payment plan with that stretches it out over the course of a year. You can use that if that helps as well. And then we also have need-based tuition, uh, which is an option for people who, for whatever reason, the price point is out of your fixed income or fixed budget. We don't wanna price people out. So especially people who are like single parents or you're on disability or you're only working part-time or you know, COVID really set you back or whatever it might be, just check that out. And if it's helpful, please do take advantage of it. Those are limited, so make sure you take advantage of that uh, sooner than later. But um, you know, if you have any questions about any of it, again, just feel free to email us. That's info at nightlightastrology.com. So with all of that being said, um, I am very happy to have Ashley back and I'm going to bring her on right now. Hey. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good. It's good to have you back and to be talking plants again, plant medicine. Um, we in particular, we are going to be talking about Jupiter's entrance into Aries and three of the major themes uh, that tend to come up with this planetary placement, and also talking about how we can support the development or cultivation of these energies over the course of the next year with some plant teachers, which you don't necessarily have to take the whole time Jupiter is in Aries. You don't necessarily have to take them at any particular time while Jupiter is in Aries. They're just good teachers to potentially work with to support and cultivate what Jupiter and Aries is doing. And that's at least that's how I've understood it and what, what you've shared with me as we prepared this talk. So um, let's look at the, just let's remind ourselves, Jupiter enters Aries on May 10th of 2022. So that's coming up really soon. And this is a transit that is going to have some particular dates. So May 10th to October 28th of this year, Jupiter's in Aries. It retrogrades out into the late degrees of Pisces and then it comes back again December 20th and is there in Aries all the way through May 16th. 
this is a, an energy that we talk about as it's like cosmic spring. It doesn't mean it has to be spring seasonally where you live. You could be in the Southern hemisphere and you're about to hit, you know, autumn right now as we're hitting spring in the Northern hemisphere. There's going to be dates here, you know, between December and May of next year. We're in the dead of winter and Jupiter is in Aries and the same spring like qualities will apply. These are teachings that are linked in symbolism with seasonal energies, but are not literally tied to them. That's important to mention right away, because we're going to talk a lot about energies that feel very spring-like. It's the first couple of days of spring here in Minnesota right now. And so, you know, that energy is kind of in the air, but I don't want people to link it too literally because any of these energies are with us, you know, at any time of life, really. And Jupiter in Aries is applicable kind of no matter what the weather looks like. So that's just get that out of the way first. But before we do that, I thought it would be fun because the last times that, you know, when I first started talking about Jupiter and Aries at the beginning of this week, I shared some stories. I was like, okay, just to give you a feel for what Jupiter and Aries is like, let's go back and do some biographical homework. So I figured if Ashley's going to come on as a guest, she has to be submitted to the same homework that we've all been doing lately, which is the, the biographical stuff. So 2010 into 11 was the first phase. And then we went back and I think it was 99 to 2000, right around there was the second phase. So you have to tell us a little <laughs> bit, whatever you feel comfortable with, but a little bit about what those periods were like for you. Yeah. Well, it's funny because while you were saying that, I was looking at the shirt that I chose for today, which is born to create. I don't know if you can see it with the. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that's such this energy is this like, there's just this new energy of creation and wanting to create and do something new. So, so the last time this transit came through my chart. Um, I had worked with some other people in the community in Maryland to create this, what was called, we called it the raw life retreat. It was raw food. We had um, yoga and um, it was the first time actually that I met you, Achuta, my now husband. Um, so, you know, but that was like that, that retreat really kickstarted a huge uh, kind of burst in my profession. You know, I connected with so many people who to this day I'm still connected with. So that was like a real explosion of um, communal energy and 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 uh, yeah, growth in terms of 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 my work. And then um and then we opened up Sky House. You and I did, you know, in 2011. Um, you know, we started the wheels started turning and we came up with the name Sky House Yoga, bringing together, the, we, we, our business was birthed out of a home. We rented a house and the lower level was the studio. On uh, the upper level, level we had um, our office spaces that we worked out of and then we lived upstairs. So it was literally like a house um, and sky, you know, just the idea of how the sky bridges um, astrology and the sun, the energy of the sun is infusing the plants. And so uh, kind of earth, earth and sky brought together with sky and house, house being earth, earthy too. So that, that was, I mean, I think that was, and I also traveled, I went to Peru, um, you know, kind of like when you and I first got to know each other, um, I had made a big pilgrimage. I had just gotten out of a long relationship and was trying to process that. And, um, and so I, I traveled to Peru and, started, yeah, just sort of like trying to process and figure out my next steps. And then you and I met, we were kind of on and off again um, until the raw retreat, which I was like, he's really cool. But then it was on and off again. And then in September, it was like game on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that raw retreat was uh, such a confluence of um, people and ideas and, uh, and was the first time we met and worked together. And then, you know, by the fall, we were dating and then very quickly decided to start a yoga studio. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It was a fast, fast birthing process that happened. <laughs> so Jupiter and Aries too, like so many things accelerate so rapidly and the impulse to start things and expansion meets newness and boldness and let's do stuff. And, and that's the, the quality of Jupiter and Aries. And it was definitely around, I mean, I already shared my story, but, uh, yeah, and, and interesting, just for some background, so Ashley's a Cancer Rising, so this, this Aries falls in your 10th house. It's a career place. So it was such a time of that that energy falling into the career house, which it's about to do again. So that should be interesting as you're okay. right now. Um, as we mentioned last time, you're here on a sabbatical for a year, just kind of figuring out what next steps are. And this is a great energy to, you know, to be 
helping clarify like what what the direction is for lots of people, let alone if you have it in your career house. We'll yeah. go back to 1999 and 2000. What was that like? You have uh, some stories there as well. Yeah. So at that time, um, I I helped to open up um, a, a health food store. And so it's called Roots Market in Clarksville, if any of you are in the Maryland area. Um, but basically, I was hired on to help run their supplements department because I was I was into herbs, but, you know, like, you know, just more into health and wellness. So I remember, you know, I mean, I was there at the groundbreaking. You know, I saw the building go up. I was scrubbing shopping carts in the parking lot, you know, labeling thousands of bottles. Um, so it was, you know, it was the birth and the creation of a health, the first real health food store in that area. Um, I also uh, was in Australia during that time. Um, and I was, uh, I taken some classes through the university, James Cook University up in uh, Townsville in um, Aboriginal medicine. And so I was just really interested in learning about more indigenous forms of medicine and healing. And so during that time also um, in this, during our spring break, which was the fall, um, I went, uh, I, I took some herb walks up in the bush, um, up in like the Dane Tree rainforest area, and then out in the bush with some indigenous elders from that region and learned about sacred waters and the plants and the and how they communicated with the plants and knew when the plants were ready to be giving their medicine and when they were not ready. It was, I just, that really blew my mind. And so I think that that was kind of the birthing of my, my path um, going into herbalism. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how um, Jupiter and Aries is one of the main characteristics is not just, okay, we're going to start something new, but it's also, we're going to plant seeds. <clears throat> you, for example, you know, we met each other. We didn't get married for whatever, four, four more years or something. We met each other much later in the process. We started Sky House. Um, actually, we ended up starting Sky House by the time Jupiter entered Taurus, but the seeds for it were planted while Jupiter was in Aries. So that's really, it's a fascinating thing how ex core experiences that inspire and start to open up a new horizon. That's, it's very much also a part of the process of Jupiter and Pisces transitioning into Aries where the kind of the winter dreams are transitioning into spring metaphorically. And there's then there's this burst. I came out of a relationship interestingly, uh, at the same time you did, we both were getting yeah. out of relationships. So there's just like this transitional stage and all these seeds being planted. That's really interesting. Um, well, <clears throat> thank you for doing the homework with us. Now everyone feels like, uh, and, and I just got to take the spotlight. I'm not, I'm not the only one who has to come on and share stories and all of you, you should share stories too. You can always do so by using the hashtag grabbed or sending us an email grabbed at nightlightastrology.com as Jupiter is entering into Aries. What's your story? Um, we'd love to hear from you guys. We're going to aggregate some stories uh, and have a storytelling episode again soon. Well, um, let's just click over to the real time clock really briefly and remind ourselves of what this looks like. So here is the chart for May 10th, at, at which point Jupiter is going to enter the sign of Aries. Um, it will do so as Venus is also in Aries. Just did a video on Venus and Aries. Ashley's also a Venus and Aries native. So, um, you know, having the the two together at once is uh, super, super, super human powers, especially for women and goddesses. <laughs> well, that's what I've needed this this week since everyone's been sick and like <laughs> yeah. you're sick. It's been, and I'm on like full mom duty. Like I'm like, <laughs> nothing will stop me, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's been right. helpful. Venus and Aries is de definitely gives like a good, it's a good kick. It's like Wonder Woman. <laughs> um, well, so there you can see it. Jupiter enters Aries on May 10th. I just wanted to give you a look and everyone give a look and feel for it. And it's not going to be long. As you can see Mars and Pisces down there right below Jupiter in the fourth house uh, before Mars goes through a conjunction with Neptune and then heads into Aries and conjoins Jupiter by the end of May. And if you think you know, if you think this, this, some of these energies we're talking about are explosive, wait until we have a chance to explore that one. And any of the herbs we're going to talk about as part of um, today's talk also go along very nicely with the Mars Jupiter conjunction at the end of the month. So that's, um, that's for sure. Okay. Well, there are three teachers that we're going to talk about for Jupiter and Aries or teachings with a set of teachers for each. So um, as we were going, we had three categories we wanted to talk about today, movement, courage, and endurance as 
lessons that we are often learning or energies that we are learning to embody as Jupiter moves through Aries. And then we thought, well, we'll do a plant for each. But then, you know, we decided to throw in two plants for each. And if I would have let Ashley keep going, there would have been five or six plants for each. So <laughs> okay, totally. <laughs> <laughs> this has also been like very fruitful for us to do episodes like this. And the plan at this point is to, you know, um, do more of this. And maybe we're even thinking maybe in 2023 of doing something like new and full moon uh, gatherings where we can talk about pairing plant medicines with teachings for the month or something like that. I'd love to hear if you guys would be interested in something like that. If so, yeah, definitely let us know. Cause I think, yeah, yeah it would be really cool to, yeah, just kind of like have a community of people that gather together that take the same plant and we kind of all geek out and share our experiences about it. <laughs> right. Some plant dieting, some working mm -hmm. with some plants, the stuff that would be, you know, easy for everyone to use and not dangerous or anything like that. <clears throat> um, excuse me. So three teacher, t teachers for Jupiter in Aries. Um, I'm going to talk about the theme astrologically, and then Ashley's going to pair us up with some plant teachers. So the first one, the first theme is movement. Um, one of the things that can happen, especially when we've had back-to-back, -back, Saturn moving through back-to-back -back Saturn ruled signs, Jupiter very recently moving through back-to-back -back Saturn ruled signs, a great Saturn-Pluto conjunction in a Saturn ruled sign, is that we get into periods of contraction, right? And those are those are purposeful periods that we have to work through, uh, just like contractions are a part of labor. Um, uh, closest thing I've had is a kidney stone. So that's, it's, you know, <laughs> only thing I have to compare it to, but, um, then there comes time for release opening and movement and the transition from Jupiter into Pisces to Jupiter into Aries is often one where suddenly it's time to accelerate. It's time for momentum. It's time for movement. And yet there can be uh, like the energy is there, but as many, many astrologers have said over the years about Jupiter, Jupiter presents opportunities but, you know, success is sort of where like preparation meets opportunity. So you have to be ready in a sense to harness this energy. I don't want to say harness because it's not like we're in control of it exactly, but it's aligning yourself with it such that movement becomes possible. Movement can open things, you know, in the, in the way that, for example, like right now I'm going to clean my closet. I'm going to clean out my closet because it's time. I know that just doing that is going to create movement psychically, psychologically in other areas of my life. And it's exciting because I don't exactly know where it'll show up, but I know that that will create movement. So you don't ex even have to know exactly where to apply the movement with Jupiter and Aries. You just have to be committed to like listening and aligning yourself with where it feels like movement. Okay, it's time to move. It's time to move things in a direction. And then Oftentimes with Jupiter and Aries, a cardinal sign, it's like, oh, you don't know exactly what's going to come of that, but there's a faith you're placing that moving forward in some direction in different areas of my life is going to bear fruit. So when we're talking about building movement or the importance of movement, like just in general, we have a couple of teachers, like plant teachers that are going to be ideal to pair with the need for movement or the need to create change. Uh, shift of momentum, things like that. So on that note, tell us about some of the teachers you have first. We'll start with uh, Nettles. Does that sound good? Yeah, let's start with Nettles. So, you know, if any of you watch me, I talk about Nettles a lot, but this really is, I mean, it is the premier spring energy. And again, not necessarily seasonally, but just in terms of its energetics, because it really gets things moving. And my teacher, Matthew Wood, he often says, you know, it's like, uh, it's like an old woman with a, with a broom who's just like sweeping frantically, like all of the corners trying to get the dust out. And, and if you get in the way, she'll just sweep you and kind of push you out the door. <laughs> so, you know, it's got this very, you know, it's, it's a cleansing, moving, get up, get going, uh, revitalizing type of plant. And so here's a picture of it with these very spiky, I mean, this plant is ruled mm -hmm. by Aries, according to Nicholas Culpepper, who was a very uh, well-known astrologer and herbalist. Um, and so it has a very sort of Aries, Martian, pointy, jagged. It's got these stingers, why it has the name um, it also is called stingy nettle, but it's, um, you know, when you take this plant, especially when you take it as a dried tea, as an overnight infusion, it really starts clean, cleansing the body and getting things moving. It is probably my favorite herb for boosting metabolism. And so, you know, if we think about how do we prepare the body and the mind 
for this influx of Jupiterian insight and ideas and, and expansion, um, you want to get the cobwebs and dust out. And so taking something like nettles just to really get things moving, flowing, activating your metabolism, um, all the chimneys, as they call them, of evacuation. So the bowels, the skin, the lungs, um, the kidneys, all of those get pathways start to get opened up. And, you know, one thing that all of my students have said, and, and I've had many clients over the years and myself included, is that it's kind of like, it's kind of like caffeine without, ca without the anxiety. So a lot of people find that they can either cut down on caffeine um, or replace it or just you know, support their body with getting more revitalized energy. Um, but it's really doing so through not depleting the body like caffeine can sometimes do, but actually giving your body all of the nutrients that it needs, including chlorophyll, which is just one molecule away from um, our body's hemoglobin or blood. So it's like, it's like putting extra blood. It's like getting a blood transfusion. <laughs> That's what it feels like too. I mean, I've, I've had so much, so so I know, many jars of metals <laughs> since I've known Ashley. And like, I swear to God, when you, when you drink a nettle infusion that's been soaked overnight, and by the way, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but you do, you feel like you're drinking like liquid green blood earth. And it, yeah, <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's so supportive. And in terms of like creating movement and helping you know more intuitively and instinctually where to apply that movement, I feel like nettles is a, is a really good teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Like where's the doorway <laughs> to sweep the junk out mm -hmm. and which window do you need to open to get the airflow in? Like it's Cosmic really spring. good at that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's for sure. Okay. Keep, you keep going. What's our next one? Our next one is cleavers. So cleavers is another uh, wonderful green succulent plant. Well, I guess nettles isn't succulent, but they're both like really fresh, bright green plants. And cleavers is really cool um, because it's a, herb that, um, you know, you can think of it as like, as like nature's scrub brush. So you can see in this picture on the edges, it has these like little hooks. And so what you can do, like when I was a kid, we would throw them on other people's backs as they were walking and they wouldn't know. And you'd be like, he, 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 cause they'd have like, you know, strings of these cleavers on their back. And I, I do that to the kids sometimes too. And we, <laughs> Guess I haven't grown up very much, <laughs> but um, so it, it cleaves, it sticks. And so um, it's also used by deer. Deer love to bed in it. So they'll circle around. It's also um, something that, that old farmers used to use as bed straw because um, it has this uh, this um, buoyancy to it once it dries. But the, the scrub brush piece, which is, I think, perfect for this idea of movement, is that it's like a scrub brush for the internal organs. And it really cleanses out the body and the lymphatic system, the urinary system, the colon. Um, so, you know, it's and, and also the throat, you know, it's also an herb that's been used to help people find their voice. Um, so if you feel like you you maybe are feeling a little unsure of how to speak or what to say or how to use your voice, it can sometimes just sort of <clears throat> kind of cleanse that area so that you can find that um, that inner voice a little bit more clearly. And this one really works best fresh. So nettles works best, I think, dried. But for cleavers, you want to harvest it when it's fresh. Stick it in a blender with some water and drink it like a succus or like a smoothie. Um, or, you know, um, you can... You can freeze it also in ice cubes and keep that all summer long and then throw those ice cubes into a smoothie that you make. But that's really, I think, the best way. Or if you have a juicer, you can juice it and that will also get that. And it's very cooling. It's um, cooling and refreshing in terms of its energetics. One question going back to nettles for just a second, because this is something that I, I didn't understand. When I first met you and you're like, here, have some nettles. I was like, you're crazy. Those hurt. Why would I drink them? <laughs> oh, but, right. Uh, yeah. So, so just so people can understand, like when you're talking about stinging nettles, you're not talking about, I mean, it's when, when they are dried or when you're buying bulk herbs of nettles and soaking them overnight in an infusion, um, the, the stingers are no longer a part of the plant. Could you just explain that piece? Cause it yeah. freaks me out a little bit. Oh, when yeah. I first Totally. Yeah. I mean, like this, we just went out, I went out with my daughter and check because we have nettles in our yard. And it's, you know, if you touch them when they are alive or even freshly picked, those little uh, stingers, which have formic acid in them, which is actually the same thing that you find in stinging ants bites. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it'll sting you and it'll hurt. And, um, you know, some people in, in back in the day, they would use that actually as a medicine for the joints. They would actually self-flagellate <laughs> themselves with it um, and, and bring blood flow to that area. But once it's dried, those needles dry out. And so that formic acid is no longer active. Um, and then once you add that to hot water, all of the cells of the plant break apart. So you really, you know, when you're drinking it, you won't, there's no sting in there. Um, the only way that you might get a sting, like sometimes if I'm working with a big bag of nettles and there's dust that blows up, sometimes that will irritate my skin a little bit. Um, so you can easily avoid that just by scooping rather than using your hands. <laughs> um, and, you know, you should be just fine. It's like, it's like, you know, back in the day before there were, uh, sex toy shops and 50 shades of gray was written they had nettles that was <laughs> right sorry my sixth sense of humor all right so <laughs> let's go into courage our second theme um jupiter okay so there's movement and and movement is just about moving things cleaning things like like a spring clean or the need to just get some energy going in a direction but there's this other theme that comes up which is courage I feel weak, but I have to do something that requires me to be strong. I tend to be passive. I need to be a little bit more assertive. Um, the quality of bravery or courage is, remember, Aries is the sign in which the sun is exalted. So it's a Mars-ruled sign and is often associated with those things that protect the honor or nobility of whatever the sun represents. So a warrior that protects freedom a knight that serves the king in like an Arthurian sense. Um, so Aries has this quality of defending and protecting that which is noble. But that also means that there are, are sometimes like, oh, like Aries is great. If you ever have a, if you're ever being bullied, you hope you have an Aries friend because it's the Aries friend that'll just, you know, sock the bully in the face or whatever. Not that that's, I do not advocate violence. <laughs> <But> <laughs> you, you get the idea, right? So Jupiter in Aries has a lot to do with finding strength, courage, especially for people who may tend to be weak or vulnerable. So that sense of like rise up. For example, in 2011, the last time that Jupiter was in Aries, there was a Tunisian street vendor who was being oppressed by the government. And he set himself on fire as a demonstration for standing up to, you know, government bullying of people in the marketplace. And that in turn released this fire of uh, revolutionary energy around the Mideast, which is very violent at times, called the Arab Spring, which in turn uh, sparked Occupy Wall Street here in the United States by the fall, which, I mean, one of our first dates in New York City, we went down to see what was going on. Uh, and we it turned out nothing was going on at all when we went down there. So we ended up, there was like nothing really happening. You know, we didn't know. We, I was not like someone who was there regularly. And I was like, I want to see what this is all about. So we went down there. We ended up going to the Empire State Building, I think, didn't we? We did. Yeah, that was yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, random story. But <clears throat> Occupy Wall Street, anything where there's advocacy, um, protection, protest. It's interesting to me, for example, that we're hearing about Roe v. Wade being overturned and Jupiter's about to enter Aries, Venus is in Aries, that sense of potential political conflict and uprise, like that is that is exactly the kind of energy that was present when Jupiter was in Aries. Of course, Jupiter was in Aries along with Uranus just entering Aries back in the early, like 2010, 11. So it's a little bit different, but still it's a very powerful energy in terms of standing up for things and finding courage and strength and things like that. What kind of plant teachers can help us cultivate or work with that, especially if we're someone to whom that, that kind of energy is intimidating or maybe even scary? Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about, you know, people standing up for rights, like civil rights, human rights, women's rights, um, you know, dandelion, I mean, dandelion, it comes through the cracks. It's like, hi, you cannot oppress me. You know, it will, you know, you, you lived in New York City, you know, dandelions are everywhere. They're prolific. They're, they're on every continent on this earth. So, you know, they are very bold, very daring, very resourceful, um, and very, they're actually ruled by Jupiter. So they're, um, you know, very expansive and uh, and bright too. You know, it, it has sort of a a very sunny disposition as well as being very expansive. And so this this herb, I just think of, you know, when people need to break through barriers, to break through cracks, to find courage, um, to alleviate, 
either inner oppression, like self, self-placed self oppression or external oppression, that dandelion can be a really good medicine. And one thing that's interesting to know is that dandelion is a liver herb, especially the roots. And, you know, sometimes what can happen is oppression can turn into repressed anger or not repressed anger, just anger. And so what dandelion can do is it can help to transform anger into action. Mm. And I think that's an energy that we could really use right now because there is a little, you know, there's a, there is quite a bit of divisiveness right now. And so how do we take all of that fire and all of that Aries energy and anger and turn it into something that is actually going to uplift and, you know, create more opportunities for more people. So, you know, we can do that on an individual level, collect and, and let that influence the collective. So, you know, I think dandelion root in particular as a medicine rather than the leaves, the leaves are a little more of a diuretic, but I think right now the root would be a really nice medicine to take. You know, it's interesting because the first time I ever took dandelion was, um, I had read that it was good for dealing with liver things and um, with anger. I had read it online because I was in graduate school and I was writing, I was in a creative writing program and I was writing fictional accounts of ayahuasca ceremonies. There's a plant medicine that's been really important to me as most people listening to this channel know. And um, I had some classmates that thought it would be funny to mock, you know, they just thought I was a crazy hippie basically and that I was into drugs. And, you know, so and they decided to, they actually created a, uh, a website that was a mockery of one of the short stories that I wrote in my class about ayahuasca. And I found out about it because someone told me and I started taking dandelion because I felt this overwhelming desire to get into a physical altercation with one of the guys in the class who did it. And I was trying to practice pacifism and I was looking online for things you can take herbally to deal like, cause I was into plant medicine because of ayahuasca. So I was like, what can I take herbally to help me deal with anger? Mm -hmm. And I started taking dandelion and my anger went away. And I, I, I felt strong, but like I was able to like feel like I had control of those qualities and I was able to find some harnessing of that that made sense. And instead I went and reported them to the department of, you know, which I thought was kind of like the weak way out, right? Like you don't go tell on someone, you just punch them. That's what I felt at the time. <laughs> I know that's really lame, but like, that's what I felt. And I really, to this day, feel like it was dandelion that helped me just go and report them and do the mature thing, um, which was still took a lot of courage for me because I thought that was kind of like the, the weaker thing to do to tell on someone, but actually it, it served the, purpose and it got the job done. And I'll just always feel grateful for dandelion for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that's part of the root medicine is that it does, it really roots us down into like, and, and long-term growth too. I mean, dandelions, they, I mean, they're so, they, within, within one flower are like a thousand seeds for the future. So it's like, you know, they are, they're aware of how big and, you know, they're, they're aware of how, how big their spread can be, um, but staying rooted, drawing the, the minerals that they have and staying, staying low, you know, lower to the ground is part of how they pull it off. So that's a great yeah. story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you want to take us on to our next one? Yeah, let's do it. So the next one is Mullen. So mullen is, uh, it's, it's, you know, a lot of the plants that I talk about are kind of weeds or, you know, roadside plants. That <laughs> a lot of us, yes. Sorry. This is what happens when you don't have childcare. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. I will do that in a few minutes. <laughs> Here, how about this? You start talking about mullen and I'll go see what's up. Okay. <laughs> Hold All on, right. let, me, let me let me amplify it there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, babe. <laughs> so so yeah. So a lot of these plants are kind of like roadside weeds, or they're you know they're plants that not uh, you know we don't think of as like you know beautiful plants we might cultivate in a garden, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, they're very wonderful plants. And the nice thing is that a lot of them are easy to find. So you might have actually seen this one as you drive along roadsides pretty much 
through the Midwest, through the West Coast, East Coast, here of the United States. They grow throughout Europe. Um, but, uh, but this plant, the reason why I think this is a really nice one for courage, um, is that it has this tall, long stalk and in traditional medicine and in the doctrine of signatures, we look at that tall, long stalk as being this, like referring to the spine. And so for people who have spinal curvature, like rounded shoulders or, um, uh, kyphosis of the shoulders or Dowinger's hump. Mullen is a medicine that brings you back upright. And even if you don't physically have spinal issues, but maybe it's just more posture issues, you know, you're at a computer a lot. Um, but posturally, when we our shoulders are rounded forward, it closes the heart energy. It also it also compresses the lungs. So we can't get as much oxygen into our bodies. And if we can't get as much oxygen, we don't have as much energy. And so it's interesting that this, that this plant does two things for us right there. Number one, it brings us more upright, helps to lengthen the spine. It's also a lung tonic. So um, in the doctrine of signatures, the leaves, are wide and full. They have these little cilia or little hairs on it that look a lot like the cilia and hairs in the lungs. And so it helps us to take deep breaths. It's a, it's a really good lung tonic. It's actually one that I gave to Achuta when he was having difficulty um, you know, experiencing some of his COVID symptoms. It was one of the herbs I gave to him to help him because he was like, you know, having a hard time breathing. So it just lifted him up. I told him to put his rest his head back and take some deep breaths. And I feel like this was one of the plants that really helped him get that confidence, that uprightness, that courage to keep breathing and keep going. Um, not that he was like not being courageous. He was, you know, just having difficulty, <laughs> but it, you know, it really brought him upright and helped that breathing. So this is a plant that I think is really excellent for that. And you can use the, um, the leaves as a tea. Now they do have little hairs on them. So I recommend when you strain it, that you strain it through muslin cloth or cheesecloth, just so that those little hairs don't irritate the throat. Yeah. Oh, and then one yeah. more thing about it is that it's also, it was also used, um, you know, in, you know, more pagan traditional medicine of, of Europe um, as a torch. So it's also ca called, um, you know, witch's torch or torch broom or torch light, um, because when you, when it dries out, um, you can just dip it in kerosene and light it and you can walk through the woods. So it like, you know, in terms of like lighting the way um, it is upright kind of brightness, um, you know, it actually literally can be a torch in the dark. Right. So disaster averted downstairs. Thank you. <laughs> Tem temporarily anyway, we're on it. We're definitely on a countdown. Okay. So we're going to go into our third, um, lesson for Jupiter and Aries, which is endurance. Um, there's a couple of ways of talking about endurance. Uh, one would be that Jupiter and Aries tends to start things, which is good. But we also need support because one of the shadow sides or potential sort of blind spots of Jupiter and Aries is you can burn fast, bright, fast and hard and then burn out. Um, so in order to almost counter or complement or enhance or support this energy and what it tends to not do so well with, we're going to talk about endurance because Jupiter and Aries can be about, you know, creating movement, creating action, creating change, but it's fast. It, it, it sort of burns hot and bright and can kind of fizzle out quickly. So there's also sometimes the shadow of Jupiter and Aries is endurance, like sticking with things, seeing them through, seeing them through to completion. I mean, there is a, there is a sense in which some seeds are planted and, you know, in a sense, it's like, well, Jupiter and Taurus's job will be to, you know, sustain and carry it or something. But it's important because we can burn ourselves out or we can get burnt out easily. Like another picture of endurance would be, you know, Jupiter in Aries could be a picture of someone who works in a really fast paced corporate cutthroat executive environment, a lot of fast, important executive decision making qualities, you know, just kind of in the air. <clears throat> in order to make sure that you're not exhausted by living in an environment like that, if you're someone who was born with Jupiter in Aries, or if you find that the energies are just like throttling down really intensely, there are there is the need to make sure that you are that you have practices that can sustain the energy. So it's just really important kind of buffer for this energy is think about sustaining, supporting, and in in qualities of endurance. Okay, so along those lines, um, general teachings about Jupiter and Aries, which plant teachers can help us with those things? 
So Eleuthero is the first one that came to mind for me. This is also called Siberian ginseng. Even though it's not in the ginseng family, it has the same qualities as a lot of our other ginsengs, like American ginseng um, and also Chinese or Panax ginseng. So here we use the root, even though this is a beautiful picture of the berries and the leaves. Um, medicinally, we use the root. And this is probably my most used adaptogen. An adaptogen in herbal terms uh, just simply means that it helps the body adapt to stress. It helps to regulate what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is our stress response and how we use cortisol. It's like the gas and the brakes. And so I think with this energy of um, Jupiter and Aries, you know, yeah, there's going to be a lot of pushing forward, but how do you make sure when, how, you know, that you know when to let up on the gas a little and when to apply the brakes a little, right? And so Eleuthero is a great one. And it's my most, it's the one that I use the most out of all the adaptogens because I feel like it, it's not too hot, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. It's not too drying and it's not too moistening. So for most people's energetics, they tolerate it very well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of like the most moderate of the ginsengs. Also, David Winston, who is an herbalist who wrote a book on adaptogens, he talks about how American ginseng is kind of like for younger people. Um, it's for people that are aged maybe like, you know, 20 to 30 or 20 to 35. Um, it's a little bit more cooling and it's a little more moistening which they, you know, um, which they need a little bit more of. And then Eleuthero is more midlife. So it's really for the, you know, 35 to 45, 50, that midlife adaptogen that kind of sustains the energy that you have in midlife. And then Panax ginseng or Chinese ginseng is for the elders. Um, it's because it's really warming and very stimulating. So once the chi has gone down, you need that, you know, you need a more, you need a bigger boost of heat and more chi and so it's more applicable to to the older population. So I think probably for you know a lot of us, Eleuthero might be. I think in that way, it's also a really nice plant to to think about. Um, and also, you know, American ginseng, but make sure that you source it from an ethically wild crafted or also um, from someone who sources it responsibly because it is an endangered plant. So uh, whereas Eleuthero um, is not, it's it's very easily able to be grown commercially. Um, so it's a little bit better that way. And I would recommend taking Eleuthero as a tincture. That's, that's the way that I recommend it for my clients. And you could just take two droppers full um, in the morning and that should do fine or one dropper full in the morning and one in mid afternoon, but it's not a great one to take in the evening because it can boost your energy a little bit. Yeah. Someone who took a Luthro, um, <clears throat> last year for a good portion of the year, I was working with a Luthro on Ashley's advice and found it really supportive of, um, working out in, especially in the winters, like in the basement of the house we we're living in, I was like working out and, you know, in the basement, the gyms weren't open because of COVID and like just the, the feeling of being supported in enduring, like staying strong and enduring a long COVID winter, like Eleuthero was such a helper. Um, also I did mention to Ashley, like the median demographic on this channel is 25 to 45. So I was just kind of telling her like, that's 80% of the demographic of who watched this show. So don't be offended if you're outside of that youthful age range. Yeah, sorry, I guess. Yeah, about. I should have. <laughs> I, I, I gave her that in info. So <laughs> but, you know, the nice, yeah, but the nice thing is like, you know, you can choose for yourself, which one seems to be the best match. Right. And again, those lines are very blurred because if you tend to run really hot, you might like that cooler one. Um, even if you are a little bit, you know, more, you know, in the middle life phase. So, right. you right. know, there it's all, it can all be very flowy yeah, yeah. <laughs> in that. Um, and then and also like, also like um, just another, one other thing that I would say about Eleuthero in, in general is that to my mind, there's, it's knowing what phase of life you're in. Like if, you know, in, like in India, we talked about the Grihasta ashram, which is like, life is busy. Your, your kids, action, relationships, social life, work and job. And in that phase of life, I think, I feel like it's a phase more than it is an age. That's a great point. Yeah, You know, the, it, it, it's like if you're in a phase of life where things are slower, quieter, gentler, the, the waves are kind of moving like that a little bit more than like this, then I, you know, that might be another way of thinking about w what type of supportive plant to use. That's a great point. Anyway. Okay. Keep going. 
Um, yeah, and then the last one is ashwagandha. Um, this is a traditional herb from India. It's used in Ayurveda. And here we use the root as well. So um, this medicine is, um, yeah, I like I like how this picture has a heart shape um, because it's it's actually very nourishing. It's a very nourishing adaptogen, and it's gently relaxing. So you know when I think back to the last few times that Jupiter was in Aries, I wish I was taking ashwagandha. Like I think that would have actually been a really good plant for me because it would have just taken the volume of like my intensity down a little bit, not take, not like you don't, you know, we, the idea here isn't to completely extinguish all that fire, but to temper it. And I feel like ashwagandha as an adaptogen, which modulates again, that stress response and the stress response can be really taxing on the body. So we want to be able to modulate that. And part of the way we can do that is just by turning the nervous system down, the, the noise of the nervous system down, the mind a little bit down. So this one can be really good for people that experience anxiety, who have difficulty sleeping. The Latin name is um, withania somnifera. And so somni is, comes from the Latin base of uh, sleep or like insomnia. So it, it has a long history of use for sleeplessness. And so this is a great adaptogen that can be used morning and evening, just to, again, just very gentle mellowing out of the body's energies. And a tincture would be my recommended way of taking this one as well. Yeah, I love ashwagandha. I've had uh, another one that I can offer personal testimony about. I've taken ashwagandha off and on for, you know, many years, um, always feeling like it's supportive of long hours working of being in a lifestyle that's pretty busy and just it feels to me like ashwagandha is good for um i don't know what the word is like it supports male sexual health i think too like it there's definitely like a a sense of um especially if you work a lot and you want to stay kind of buoyant with your testosterone this for for men anyway i guess this is what would be my advice like ashwagandha, ashwagandha is a really good support for that um, especially as like, I think as you're aging too, like I'm getting to my forties, like ashwagandha feels like deeply supportive and it helps me feel sort of not young, but, um, fresh. It helps me yeah. feel and like vital. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. And you know, the, the way it's described in, uh, or actually the name ashwagandha, ashwa means horse, um, and ganda is virility. So it's like the, the, the way that they think of it in India is, is he who has the virility of a horse, you know, that's what I'm going like for. Like a young right stallion, there. right? That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're oh. looking for stallion energy, um, ashwagandha is, that's, that's your ticket. <laughs> <laughs> what's the name of, what's the, the, the stallion that will take over the world from Game of Thrones? You remember that? Oh, <laughs> I forget yeah. the phrase. There's like a phrase. The world or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, totally. That's, that's the part that I remember. But the cool that's... thing about ashwagandha, though, is you know, yeah, it's it's it was traditionally used for men, although it can be used for women. But there's another herb called shatavri, which means she who possesses a hundred husbands. So there think about how, how much work that would be. Um, <laughs> one is plenty for most of us. So, uh, so you know, that would be another adaptogen that could be kind of the female side. And a lot of herbalists actually blend them together. So yeah, yeah, totally. Well, about. we've had, we've had, uh, <clears throat> we've had, uh, naughty sex toys and nettles. And now we, we have no... a poop emergency <laughs> a, with our daughter, a, a poop emergency with our daughter. Now we're telling you about women with a hundred husbands and men who have virility like horses. So you've <laughs> definitely gotten your education for the day. That's what you come here for. So we're just giving <laughs> you what you need. So if you want to, um, follow Ashley's work, check out her YouTube channel, Skyhouse Herbs. Uh, where Ashley makes lots of videos about herbal medicine and the wisdom of plant spirit teachers. Um, you can also check her out at skyhouseherbs.com. And Instagram, you can follow Ashley at skyhouseherbs. Thank you so much for being here and helping us unpack some wisdom for Jupiter's entrance into Aries. It's fun to pair the archetypal themes with plants that can practically help us embody and work with the energies. So we're trying to do more of that this year. That's like a, been a, a big intention of ours is to keep doing this. And then again, we'd love to hear from you guys. How would you guys feel about monthly new or full moon gatherings where each month we worked on 
worked with a plant teacher in concert with the astrological energies of the month. It's kind of something we've been thinking about doing. We used to do stuff like that all the time when we had our yoga studio. We haven't done it for a while, wondering what the interest would be, gauging the interest. So let us know your thoughts. In the meantime, um, that is it for now. There is a toddler wandering around with a uh, diaper situation downstairs uh, who I pacified temporarily with some vegan puffs. So um, that's only going to last for so long. So as always, please like, subscribe, share your comments, click the notification bell for updates. Remember transcripts of my talks can be found uh, in this case, our talk can be found on the website, nightlightastrology.com. Don't forget the new class, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic starts on June 5th. Hope to see some of you there soon. Thanks again, Ashley, for being here. Thanks for having me. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.